Well, good morning, church family. Go ahead and open up to 1 Timothy chapter 3 as we slowly but surely go through some of these incredible godly attributes that specifically apply to the elders and deacons, but in reality apply to all of us. This morning's title, morning's, uh, I've called it, Be Outstanding. And that's what I believe Jesus, what God is calling us to be, to be outstanding. And so we're going to finish verse 3, and we'll probably get as far as verse 5, maybe. Um, Every single one of these attributes, every single one of these characteristics, a whole Bible study can be done on each. And so I'm going to attempt to, you know, put together as many as I can in one Bible study, and so on and so on. Um, But it's just fun. It's fun doing this Bible study because there's so much to it. So let us begin. Let's just begin in verse 3. It says, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. If a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And that's probably as far as we're going to get. It's very possible that we're not even going to be able to finish it. I don't know. We'll see. But I want to start things off by saying that we need to be imitators of God. If we're going to be outstanding, we need to be imitators of God. We need to be like Christ. And Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And so here Paul is saying, be like God, be like Jesus. And so the six things that we're going to be hopefully covering today is not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, rules his own house well. So let us begin with the first one. Don't be violent. The opposite of that would be be patient, as I explained. Now, this word violent means smiter, right? One who strikes, injures, or slays with the hand or with the weapon. I think it goes without saying that this is not Christian behavior. To be going around smacking people, striking people, injuring people with our hands or with a weapon. But there are some people out there that love looking for a fight. I don't know what it is about them, but they just love fighting people. They like to strike. They like to hurt. And it's, I mean, so anti-Christian, the complete opposite of who Jesus is and what he demonstrated to us when he himself was being struck, when he was being injured, and when he was slain. I mean, he, he just set such the example to be a sacrifice onto his father. And even the, the disciples, I mean, it almost seems like they allowed themselves to be captured and they allowed themselves to be tortured and they allowed themselves to become martyrs, seemingly without a fight. And I know for some of us, it, it, there's a fine line. Well, if someone comes at me, I'm going to defend myself. And that's a tough one. I mean, that's definitely up for a good discussion. But at least when it comes to Jesus and when it comes to the disciples, it almost seemed like the disciples followed the example of Jesus. And Jesus, I mean, in some cases, it says that he didn't even say a word to defend himself. He just, he remained silent. And that when he did open his mouth, he would say things like, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Or he would, you know, he was praying to his father and, and, and saying things like, Father, why have you forsaken me? And Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. But I really don't want to concentrate so much on the smiting or the striking because this word violent also means pugnacious. Now, what does that mean? It means this, eager or quick to argue and quarrel, having an aggressive nature, being chippy. Someone that's walking around with a, with a chip on their shoulder, like they have to prove themselves. Or perhaps 
they feel inadequate. And so they got to show that they are adequate, that they are more than qualified. And so they walk around with this sort of a bad attitude, sort of this uh, defensive type attitude where they just feel like they're being attacked from every way. And so, you know, their, their MO is to attack back or to prevent themselves from being attacked. And so they're chippy. I mean, they, they just, they, they seem to be on edge. They seem to be just having this attitude about them. A lot of that could, could be with a low self-esteem. A lot of that can be with, you know, they got taken advantage of before. And so because of resentment or bitterness or fear, uh, they have put themselves in a place where that would just never happen ever again. And so they kind of walk around with a chip on their, on their shoulder. Um, it could also be just like a lack of, of uh, confidence. Um, so many reasons as to why people are chippy or even pugnacious. This word also means feisty, discordant, contentious. The discordant one, it's like everyone's having fun, and then here's the discordant one. He's always the grumpy one, or he's always the, the negative one. He's the Debbie Downer. He's the one that's not having fun. Everybody's having fun, but he's not having fun. She's not having fun. She's just discordant. She's not willing to jump in to whatever the situation is. Uh, they're pugnacious, and they're quick to be this way. They're eager, in fact, to be this way. Charles Spurgeon said this, Don't go about the world with your fists doubled up for fighting, carrying a theological revolver in the leg of your trousers. I mean, this can apply to all of us. It most definitely applies to the pastor. It most definitely applies to the elders and to the deacons. But it most definitely applies to all of us Christians. Let's not walk around this world you know, feeling like we're being attacked, and so therefore our dukes are up at every single thing, and we got to fight for Jesus, you know, and, and we're carrying this theological revolver in, in our, you know, in the leg of our trousers and ready to pull it out at any given moment. I think there's wisdom involved here, and I just think that this, you know, what Charles Spurgeon said here is something that he himself had seen, perhaps even experienced, and that it really doesn't bring about any good or lasting fruit. I mean, the truth of the matter is words hurt. They absolutely hurt. And I remember as early as, you know, in the rehab home back in 95, 96, we would walk around. I remember we started learning scriptures. And, and one of the sayings that we would say to each other was, oh, you're slaying him with the word. Oh, I just got slayed by the word. And we were shanking people with verses is what we would do. I would go around, and if I saw misbehavior, if I saw something that was out of order, it was almost like, aha, busted, I got you. And not only do I got you, but I even got a verse to get you, and so I would shank them with the word. It wasn't out of concern. It wasn't in love. It wasn't because I cared for them. It wasn't like I would take them off to the side privately and go, hey, brother, listen, man, I'm seeing this, and I'm concerned for you. I love you. And, you know, the, the Bible says this, and I just think that maybe we should, you know, apply this. And let me help you apply this. It wasn't like that. It was almost like in front of everyone, I would shank them so that people can be like, oh, snap, you just got slayed by George with the word. And it was almost kind of like this boastful thing. I was one of those that walked around with the theological revolver in the leg of your trousers. Not just in the leg of my trousers, but in the back, in my pockets. I had like seven guns ready to go. Truth of the matter is, words can hurt. I mean, the way we speak to one another, those words can be more lethal than anything physical that we do to them. The way we speak to our husbands and the way that we speak to our wives and the way that we speak to our children, words can hurt, even if it's well-intentioned. I mean, I grew up in, a, in an environment where sarcasm and uh, sort of like this negative feedback was used in order to bring about positive feedback. It was almost like, I'm going to try to embarrass you for the embarrassing, um, you know, attitude or bad attitude that you have. And so I'm going to embarrass you in such a way to where you're so embarrassed to where you'll never do that again. And from that point on, you'll only do good 
Well, all it really did was provoke me to more and more anger. All it did was frustrate me more. All it did was it affected my self-esteem. It messed with my head, and it made me rebel even more. It actually, it actually for me, it negatively affected me worse. But I knew that my parents meant, meant it all in love. I know that they were trying to help me. They just didn't do it right. They used words that hurt. To this day, I could still remember the things that they said. And even the things that I don't remember, I do remember how they made me feel. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 7, it says, And they spoke to Rehoboam, that's King Solomon's son, saying, If you are kind to these people, and you please them, and you speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. They will be your servants forever. Unfortunately, Rehoboam did the opposite. And he spoke unkindly to the people. He was harsh to the people. And what did the people do? They revolted. They rebelled. And that's what started the civil war with Israel. That's where Israel split the north and the south. Israel and Judah. It split because Rehoboam did not take this advice. Be kind to the people. Please them. Speak good words to them. And then they will be your servants forever. Now they rebelled against Rehoboam and the nation split. Because of words, churches split. Because of things, the way they are said. Relationships split. Married couples split. Families split. I mean, there's so much damage that could happen from speaking harshly, speaking bad things, saying bad words, words that are not godly, words that are more destructive than anything, and how that can lead to a split, split in friendships, in all kinds of relationships. And here we see that because of the way he spoke to the people, the way he treated people, the whole nation split. A whole bunch of people rebelled against Rehoboam. Proverbs 31, verse 26 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Uh, this applies perfectly for a mother. A, a mother who, when she opens her mouth, perhaps to rebuke and to discipline, it's with wisdom. And there's the teaching of kindness on her tongue. This can apply to all parents, right? This can apply to all pastors. Anyone that's in some form of a teaching position where they're speaking to people. Be careful how you speak to people. Be, be careful that when you open your mouth, it's not un, unwise words coming out or ungodly words coming out. Sarcasm or something that hurts, something that beats down. Let it be words of wisdom. Let it be a teaching opportunity. Kindness is on their tongue. Proverbs 25, verse 15, with patience, a ruler may be persuaded and a soft tongue will break a bone. I can't tell you how many times I have caused an argument simply because of my tongue and the way I came across. Whether I responded or I started the conversation, I just came out hard, harsh, kind of just, you know, not nice, just straight to the point, kind of sharp, mean sounding, aggressively sounding. But here in Proverbs 25, it says that a, with patience, a ruler may be persuaded. Not with violent words, not being pugnacious, but being patient. A ruler, a leader, someone with authority and power may be persuaded. And a soft tongue will break a bone. Talking about conviction. Sometimes when we respond in kindness, when someone's aggressive towards us, but we respond in kindness, when our kids are out of control, but we respond with kindness. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, sugarcoating. I'm talking about, no, I'm going to share with you the consequences. I'm going to share with you the rebuke. I'm going to share with you the exhortation. You're going to get admonished right now, but the way it's going to come out, it's not going to come out out of control. I'm yelling at you, going off at you. I've lost control. No, no, no. I'm going to come at you with a soft tongue in hopes that that 
will convict you. I mean, when you have been convicted by the Lord, has it always been, have you ever sensed that the Lord is just yelling at you, like he's just going off on you? I mean, isn't it always like that soft little touch, that, that like little whisper, that little kind little word that's said to us? And it's, it could be something like, I love you too, hey, you're out of line. But it, it breaks us, it convicts us, it humbles us. If that's the way the Lord speaks to us, that's the way we should be speaking to one another. I like this quote. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. I was just talking with someone about this this morning. Like 25 plus years ago when she was in the high school group, she was going to be on the worship team, and she tried out. She was excited. She wanted to worship the Lord. She wanted to be a part of the ministry and wanted to help out in the high school ministry. And then she said, but the worship leader was so critical and so harsh and so mean and so controlling and so demanding that she just said, you know what? You can keep it. I don't, I don't even want to be a part of it. And really hasn't been a part of a worship team, team since. Now, she doesn't remember what he said, but she definitely remembers how it made her feel. This is 25 plus years ago. I'm telling you, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Hey, in this time, let's make people feel loved. Let's make them feel like they're not alone. Let's make them feel supported. Without compromising our convictions, let them feel supported, that we're there for them whenever they need us, whether it's because they just want someone there to be able to minister to them or to fellowship with them, or listen, I'm there for you. When you're ready to repent, when you're ready to make changes, I'm here, man. I'm, I'm here for you. I will be here to help you through that. That makes people feel loved. Now, this person who's not violent is one who lets God fight their cause. They just look at the situation and instead of putting their dukes up ready to defend themselves and fight for their cause or even for the cause of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, they just go, you know what? I'm just going to let the Lord handle this. I'm going to let the Lord handle this. Like Michael, the archangel, let the Lord rebuke you, Satan. I'm not even going to fight you. I'm not going to try to argue with you or defend myself or the Lord or the king, the Lord rebuke you. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Sometimes you just got to go, you know what? The Lord rebuke you. Or you know what? I, I just give this to the Lord. Lord, I'm trusting you to handle this for me. And of course, what does Paul say in Romans chapter 12, verse 19? Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. And so we have to trust that the Lord's going to handle business for us. Part of the problem is I want the satisfaction of handling business myself. I want to feel avenged. I, I want to show my strength and I want to show my power and I want to see them suffer because they made me suffer. Payback. That's an attitude that we need to be very careful with. We need to repent of. It's not an attitude at all that I see commended in the scriptures I don't see that attitude at all with Jesus, even with the way God deals with us. I believe that that is a very anti-Christian type attitude and view. I think that sometimes we just have to let the Lord handle business, and that can be really hard because the feelings of hurt and anger are still there. And we just want to do something. We want some kind of a payback, some kind of a satisfaction. But man, the Lord says, let me deal with it. And to give it up to the Lord can be a very difficult thing, but so help me God, in the strength of the Holy Spirit, he will let me give it to the Lord and trust the Lord to handle business for me. Now concerning argumentative people, because perhaps you know people that are just argumentative, they just love to argue. Any post that you put up, they're going to argue it. Anything that you say, they're going to argue it. Anything that we say here at Calvary Chapel, they're going to argue it. Anything that I say, they're going to argue it. There are argumentative people. Well, concerning those people, 
pray for those people. We need to love those people. But maybe we don't need to talk to those people all of the time. This is what I mean by that. It's best sometimes to not engage with them. Remember that negative attention is still attention. If someone tries to goad you into an argument, simply don't go there. Some people actually like to argue because it gives them a temporary feeling of power and gratification. Avoid being sucked into their need for attention. Some people like to argue because they love that attention. They love, it's almost like a pride thing. They love to hear themselves speak. If they sense that, if they feel like they're scholarly or if they feel like they're intelligent, they just love to argue for the sake of arguing because they just love, they're wordsmiths or something. They're like word ninjas and they just love to battle anyone at any time. It's a form of attention. It's a form of pride. It's a form of power and it's a form of gratification. Don't give in to them. The best thing you can do is ignore it. Walk away from it. And all of a sudden, you take any power away from them. Don't get sucked in to their need for negative attention. Be patient instead. Don't be violent. Be patient. Proverbs 16, verse 32. Better a patient person than a warrior. One with self-control than one who takes a city. A warrior, one who takes a city, that's that person that's ready to fight, man. They're, they're violent. They're a smiter. Right? They're a striker. They slay. But the Bible tells us better a patient person than a warrior. A person with self-control than someone who's able to take a city. Proverbs 14, verse 29, whoever is patient has great understanding but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. And that is absolutely true. Someone that is patient has great understanding. They're able to distinguish. Is this a positive? Is this a negative attention? Is this someone that's just arguing for the sake of arguing? Is this even worth arguing about? Is there any way that I could plant a seed that it wouldn't be casting pearls to the swine? Is this an opportunity that I could have to win this person over with a soft tongue, with words of kindness? You know, a person that is patient has this kind of understanding and they're able to distinguish what they're dealing with and then respond accordingly, just like Jesus. I mean, Jesus knew how to respond to different types of people. If they were sincere, he would open his heart up to them. If they were insincere, he would say a couple of things sometimes. Sometimes he would just walk away. But sometimes he would say things that would bring the words back to them to make them realize that they have been exposed. You're not trying to, you're not trying to believe in me. You're just trying to test me kind of a thing. Jesus had great understanding. He was a patient man. We are called to be like Christ. Let us be patient. Let us have great understanding. As a matter of fact, The B series by Warren Wiersbe. He has one on the book of Job called Be Patient. So my encouragement to you is if you want to learn about patience, check out Warren Wiersbe's Be Patient as he goes over the book of Job. The next thing, don't be greedy for money. Don't be greedy for money. And you know what? Maybe this applies more now than ever before because perhaps now it's like, man, I need money. We need to have money because we don't know how long we're going to be in quarantine and then we don't know what the economy is going to be like. Am I going to have a job? Am I going to have any work in the future? So I better hoard all my money or do whatever I got to do to get some money. My encouragement to you is be generous instead. Don't be greedy for money. Yes, you can be responsible with your money. Be wise with money, but be careful that it doesn't cross over to greed. Don't be greedy for money. Be generous. Now, in other translations, like the King James Version, I think it says, not greedy for filthy lucre. Now, that applies to both the deacons and the elders. Now, this word lucre means money gained in a dishonorable and dishonest way. It's money that can be earned illegally by stealing, by manipulating, by fleecing, by cheating, 
like for example, cheating on your taxes kind of a thing, it's evil. We are not to gain this type of money, a money that is gained in a dishonorable and dishonest way. Now for us elders and deacons, especially the elders and the pastors, this is a warning to those leaders about having proper management of God's money. And we talk a lot about tithes and offerings, right? This is a warning to us that we better have a proper management of the money that is given by the people. And so we've done a lot of things, checks and balances to where there's transparency, there's more people, there's several people in a chain where everything is taken into, uh, you know, everything's written down and then it's counted again and then it's counted again and then it's counted again. Why? Because we want to be as transparent as possible. Because we want you to be able to trust us that we are praying about how to properly manage God's money. Me, myself, as a pastor, I don't even touch the money. I don't want to touch the money. If you have a tithe and an offering, don't give it to me. Just mail it. <laughs> give it to the church. I just don't want to touch it. That's just me. Uh, I just I want to be as transparent as possible. I don't want to know who's tithing. I don't want to know how much they're tithing. I don't want to know any of that. I just know that when it's there before us, I want to be able to bring that to the board and with all of us be able to talk about decisions and things that we need to do that we may properly manage God's money. Now, a leader is not to have a materialistic attitude towards money or possessions for they will be inevitably covet and be tempted to sin. That's what will happen. If you got a leader or a person, just a Christian in general, who has a materialistic attitude towards money or possessions, they will inevitably covet and even be tempted to sin. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 tells us, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We have to be careful with money. We cannot be greedy for money or possessions for that matter because it can cause us to stray away from the faith. It could cause us to pierce ourselves with many sorrows. See, the love for money will erode your character and hinder your witness, ministry, and service onto the Lord. Now, I love this quote. This is a quote that was given to pastors back, like, back in the day. I repeat that the man who will not bear poverty patiently and willingly will inevitably become the victim of mean and sordid covetousness. Again, let me read that again. I repeat that the man who will not bear poverty patiently and willingly will inevitably become the victim of mean and sordid covetousness. And you'll see pastors, for the sake of money, preach to the people what they want to hear. I've heard of cases where pastors are aware of the people that give the most tithes, and so they do everything for them and totally ignore the ones that either are unable to tithe or only tithe a little bit. That right there, that, that's a victim of mean and sordid covetousness. Or what they'll do is they'll use their, their influence or their, their power or their position to gain more money from people. Fleecing the flock, they call it. In Titus chapter 1, verse 11, talking about false teachers, it says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest lucre or gain. So to gain more money, they start preaching things that are not Biblical. I've seen a lot of churches compromise for the sake of getting grants, for the sake of getting recognition, for the sake of getting more people to come to their church so that the tithes can go up. 
And so they start sugarcoating the gospel or they compromise the word of God. And the Bible, when it's clear about certain sins, they preach, oh, no, 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 it's allowed because that brings more people in. If more people come in, more money comes in. That is a dishonest gain. Those who teach wrongly for the sake of money. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Listen, I just know this. Us pastors, we are not doing this for the money. We're, we're not. We would do this anyways. Because, well, I mean, like the scripture says, like Paul says, it's the love of Christ that compels us. I mean, the spirit is working in us. We would do this freely if we could. We would, absolutely. You better believe it. If we had to, if we had to shut down the doors, I would go get a job and still teach every Wednesday and every Sunday like I did from the very start. Why? I love the Lord and the Lord loves me. He saved me and I want to tell people about Jesus. I guess that's it. I'm compelled by the love of Christ. And just know that the, the pastors that we have here, the people that we have employed here at this church, they would do it as well. The reason why we picked them was because they were already doing it. They're not doing it for dishonest gain. They're not doing it to pay bills because this is the only job I could get. They did it because they love you. The reason why we do what we do is because we love you, because we're so loved by God, and we just want to communicate to you how much God loves you. So therefore, be generous. Proverbs 11, verse 25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Ah, it's better to be generous than it is to be greedy. I mean, again, we talk about tithes and offerings. If you tithe, the Lord is going to bless you. Well, here, it has to do with just refreshing, whether it be with money, whether it be with baked goods, whether it be with some of the things that we talked about that the homeless need, whether it's just you calling people and, and making sure that they're doing all right and you're just wanting to give a word of encouragement. The Lord says, whoever refreshes, they will be refreshed. Whoever blesses, they're going to bless. I love that. So when it comes to dealing with money, and even with generous acts, let us be generous, let us be transparent, let us be honest, and let us be trustworthy. You know, I see this a lot nowadays. Uh, I saw this on uh, some YouTube thing, and it said, I gave a random homeless person $20,000, and it's a video of this person giving a random homeless person $20,000. And of course, there's all kinds of views and likes and all this and all that. But I'm just like, well, why did you have to put it on YouTube for everyone to see? Why not just do that onto the Lord and secretly, privately, just give that $20,000 to the homeless? Why did you have to make a video about it? You know, and there's just a lot of that going on where people are, are like boasting about all of the good things that they do and they take a selfie picture as they're handing stuff out to, you know... People, and, and they're doing it because they want positive attention. They want to be recognized. They want applause. They want to be applauded. They want to be admired. They want to hear the compliments. Now, oh, my goodness, you're so kind. Look at you. You're so good. Listen, I have nothing. There's nothing wrong with informing people what we're doing in terms of, like, the masks, for example. I love telling people about the masks. But I know that the ladies that are doing these masks are not doing it for attention, they're doing it because there's a need. Same with the homeless. The people that are going out to feed the homeless. They don't do this for attention. They do it because they really love the homeless. And they've been doing this for years. And they have relationships with these homeless people. And so they're still out there serving the homeless community. Whatever it is that we do, let us make sure that we're doing it onto the Lord. And that if we share about it, it's so that we inspire people. It's so that we encourage people, not so that we can boast and brag about ourselves. Be careful, Jesus said, not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, that's going to be your reward. If you do that, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now listen, I, I get it. Compliments feel good. I love compliments. I really, really do. 
But Jesus here is talking about this. Love the compliments from your heavenly father more. Do it for your heavenly father more so than for anyone else. Don't do it to gratify yourself. Don't do it to show off. Don't do it to impress. Do it to minister and to bless the person that you're, you're being kind to and minister and bless our Heavenly Father. So the next thing is be gentle or restrained. I want to concentrate on this as being restrained. It means remaining confident and seemingly untroubled by recent problems. We find ourselves in some pretty big problems. We call it a pandemic. Being restrained or being gentle is remaining confident and seemingly untroubled as we find ourselves going through what we're going through right now. It's something that's kept under control, such as a strong emotion. For example, if you're angry, but you don't want to show it, you speak in a restrained manner. You're gentle. If you're afraid and you don't want to show it, you speak in a confident manner. You know, like at our house, at our home, when things are out of control, like for example, this pandemic, my wife and I can walk around being fearful or we can walk around being murmuring and complaining because we're frustrated or we're angry. But that is not a good example for our children. One thing I don't want my children to be is complaining I want my children to, to be gentle. I want them to have confidence in the Lord. So even when I'm anxious, and even if I'm afraid, I still want to convey confidence. I give myself over to the Lord, and I go, Lord, I just trust that you are in control of the situation. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to walk around fearful. You're in control of the situation. You are above the authorities. So I don't have to go around complaining and murmuring and flexing and vexing against, you know, the, the governor of California because he's extending our quarantine. You know what, Lord, I give it to you. And so when I speak about it, there's a confidence, there's a gentleness. It's restrained. This also describes someone who is able to listen to people and be able to take criticism without reacting. Oh, help me, Jesus, please. Like I said, I love compliments. And this is the way I am wired. People will give me a hundred compliments, but if one person gives me a criticism, that criticism will eat away at me more so than the 100 compliments. I have a hard time with criticism. And the thing about criticism, it's not always like, hey, George, I'm going to tell you how you're just not good. It's not even like that. It's, it's, it could be something like this. Hey, um, I think you need to watch the way you're talking. That's a form of criticism. So like if my wife comes up to me and goes, George, I feel like you're, you're kind of, you're being mean to the children. That's a form of criticism on my parenting. And here's where I have to be self-controlled. Here's where I should be able to listen to my wife and go, thank you, honey. I appreciate you sharing that with me. You know, there's this book that I've, uh, I read on a regular basis, Spiritual Leadership by J. Oswald Sanders. And it talks about this one brother who, he was a pastor, he was a preacher, that whenever he would receive a, some kind of a letter of criticism, which unfortunately he got all the time, the way he responded was exemplary. He would always respond in a way like, for example, if someone was criticizing the way he preached the message, he would respond in a way like, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to criticize me. Um, I'll, you know, I, I just want you to know that what I'm doing with your criticism is I'm taking it to the Lord and I'm asking the Lord to show me where I can improve. And I'm just like, as I'm reading that, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so the opposite of the way I react. But that's my goal, to be that person, that whatever criticism comes my way, whether it's constructive or even if it's malicious, that I would be able to just take it without reacting. Because typically what I want to do is react and defend myself and justify it or whatever. Just take it, receive it, ponder it with patience and gentleness. 
Consider what's being said. Maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe it's very, very true. Even if it's malicious, maybe there's an opportunity for improvement. Maybe there's an opportunity for growth. But if we just react and respond and shut it down and justify and argue and put our dukes up and you know, go into a full-blown war and battle over it, well, there goes that opportunity. Being gentle means dealing gently and fairly and equally with all people concerned. It means being just. It means being impartial. It means being fair. And it means being patient. Psalm 89 verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. This word gentleness or restrain, fairness, justice, these are the foundations of our Father's throne. This is who He is. Love and faithfulness go before Him. This is who He is. This is His character. God is gentle. God is restrained, is He not? I mean, praise the Lord that He restrained His judgment and His anger towards me when I rightfully deserved His judgment and His wrath. And what about this earth? I mean, this earth should be judged. It's worthy of God's wrath, and yet he restrains himself, and he allows the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is out convicting the world of its sin, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ through us, that people would repent from their sin. And like it says in the scriptures, it is God's desire that none should perish. And so he is patient. He's not lagging. He's patient, hoping that everyone repents, gives their life to Jesus Christ. But eventually that time will run out and eventually judgment will come. The wrath of God will be poured out upon this earth. So the time for salvation is now. But this is who God is. We need to be like God. We need to be like Jesus. God is just. It is part of his character, which means that he is always just. He cannot be unjust. And he defines and sets the standard for justice. So let us be fair. Let us be gentle. Let us have restraint. Take my yoke, Jesus said. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lonely, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. A good practice, a good discipline is to constantly be reading the Gospels throughout, just throughout your entire life, basically, because it's good to follow the examples of Jesus. It's good to always be aware of the way Jesus responded, the way he acted, the way he conducted himself, the way he treated people, the way he lived before his father, and the way he lived before the people that were for him, and even the people that were against him. And Jesus here tells us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Be like me. Learn from me, for I am gentle, restrained, and lowly in heart, meaning humble, and you will find rest for your souls. I mean, you could say this, that the reason why so many Christians are miserable, the, the reason why they're so, you know, just uh, discouraged or distraught within it's because they're not learning from Jesus. They're not being gentle. They're not being humble. They're being the opposite of. They're ready to fight. They're always fighting. They're argumentative. They're defensive. Chip on their shoulder. Let us be like God. Let us be like Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering or patience to sum it all up. This is what we are to be putting on. Tender mercies. Be merciful. Kindness. Be kind, even to mean people. Be humble. Be meek. Don't take yourself so seriously. Don't put yourself above others. Don't think, don't consider yourself better than others. Be meek and then be Patient, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. More so than ever before, this is the time where we need to let our gentleness be known to 
all men. Not just our Christian brothers and sisters, but all people. The next one, don't be quarrelsome. Now, a lot of these are similar, but there's a different layer to each of these. The next one being, don't be quarrelsome. Instead, be gracious. Warren Wiersbe said it like this, short tempers do not make for long ministries. And even if you are able to hold on to your ministry, short tempers will make you lonely in your ministry. If you would rather pick a fight than solve a problem, do not consider leading a church. Do not consider leading a ministry or even being a part of. This is about being a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. This is about being able to disagree without being disagreeable and without compromising one's convictions. Very, very important that we have both. Because I am not willing to compromise my convictions, I'm going to disagree with you. But there's a way to disagree agreeably. And that's the point about being, uh, you know, one who is gracious. Sometimes you're going to disagree with people, but how do you do it? Do you do it harshly? Do you, do you tease them? Um, are, you know, are you insensitive? Are you provocative? Are you provoking? How do you disagree with people? Do you make fun of them? Are you sarcastic towards them? Are you mean towards them? No, nah, listen, someone that is gracious, who is not quarrelsome, is someone that's able to disagree without being disagreeable and without compromising one's convictions. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And each person can be different in the way they come across. Some people will come at you lovingly and respectfully. Others will come at you disrespectfully and offensively. But we are told in the Bible that our speech must always be gracious, seasoned with salt. What does that mean? The ability to preserve or the ability to quench the situation and bring it down to where it's a relaxed situation rather than fighting fire with fire. We are to know how to answer each person, the scripture tells us. And through the Holy Spirit, we're able to do that. Let your speech always be with gracious charm, seasoned with the salt of wit, so that you will know the right answer to give in every single case. The Christian must commend their message with the charm and the wit which were in Jesus himself. And again, if we just look at the way Jesus responded to each person that came to him, there's charm and then there's wit. I mean, he would just be so charming, so loving, so kind, so gentle. And in other times, he would just have this wit about him. Like, for example, uh, whose, whose image is this on this coin? Caesar's. Well, then give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give God what belongs to God. That's wit. Just the way he was able to come across to each person. He knew how to answer. Also, take this in mind. Sometimes he didn't answer. There are times when he just stayed silent. Why? Because he knew that he would be casting pearls to swine. So why waste your time? Why even enter into this argument? You're just, you're just here to argue. You don't believe me anyway, so what's the point? Jesus knew how to respond to every situation and to every single person. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but only that which is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You know, it's, it's maybe possible, and I'm just kind of speculating here, that there is such a thing as unnecessary edification. How sometimes we just want to go and fix every problem and fix everything and give counsel to every single person, when in reality it's not necessary at the time. Maybe at the time all you need to do is listen Maybe all you need to do is just be there for them and pray for them. You don't have to preach at them. You don't have to counsel them. 
But there are times like here where it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. Know when it's necessary to edify and know when it's necessary to just listen, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Proverbs 16, verse 24, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. That's what I want to portray. I want to have pleasant words that are sweet like honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. You know, the Bible talks about how it's sharper than a a two-edged sword that's able to cut through bone and marrow down to basically to the heart of the matter. It can get into our thoughts and get into our feelings. That's how sharp the word of God is. And sometimes when there's an admonishment or a rebuke, man, it, it cuts you. Like, like David said in Psalm 51, that the conviction of the Lord broke his bones. But then there's also a time where after the edification, after the rebuke or the admonishment or the correction comes the pleasant words You know, sometimes I have to rebuke my children. I love my children. Sometimes I have to rebuke them. But I have to remind myself that after I'm done rebuking them, I need to come with them, come at them with pleasant words. That the rebuke has definitely affected them. It has, quote, unquote, broken their bones. But now I need to come with pleasant words and heal those bones. Remind them that I love them. Remind them that I'm proud of them. Remind them that no matter what, I will always be there for them. Proverbs 15, verses 1 and 2. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. This verse was a verse that God really spoke to me this past week. I mean, it was just something that happened between my wife and I. You know, she said something, and I reacted in a way which, I mean, what it did is it stirred up anger. It hurt And the Lord took me to this verse right here. Like, George, a soft answer turns away wrath. This is is one of those lessons. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because, listen, we all fall short. We all need God's grace. We're all learning. I'm learning. I'm still a student of the word and will always be. But because of quarantine, we're probably home a little bit more than the usual, And usually when that happens, things can flare up. Things can come up. There's irritations. There's frustrations. There's this. There's that. There's a lot of things that could happen. So no matter if someone comes at you gently or even meanly for that matter, a soft answer turns away wrath. You know, even even on the posts and the way we respond to people and the things that we put on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Mm. Strive to cultivate the gift of pleasant and wise conversation. It's so important that we cultivate this, practice in knowing how to speak pleasant and wisely. Cultivate the gift of pleasant and wise conversation so that you may be able to speak appropriately to each individual with their peculiar needs with whom you come into contact. Be ready. In and out of season, you got to be ready to respond to people's needs or perhaps complaints or perhaps criticisms or perhaps attitude, whatever the case might be, you have to cultivate the gift of pleasant and wise conversation. Be genial, be cordial, be approachable. Don't be a lover of controversy. (coughs) Excuse me. Project warmth, appear approachable and remember to smile. The reason why I'm saying this was because I had to remember to smile. I'm telling you, I've shared this with you before. I have a natural, like, frustrated look or mad look or what we used to, in the neighborhood, we used to call it mad dog. So this is my normal look. I wake up like this. This is natural me, right here, what you see. And some people take that as, are you mad? Are you going to fight someone? Are you going to fight me? Um, 
Did someone disrespect you? What's going on? So I had to do this. Smile. It's a little different, but this is better than... When I'm walking up to people, I, I have to remind myself, hey, smile, because... Some people have said this to me, George, when you're walking up to me sometimes, it's intimidating. I'm like, dude, I'm only five foot nothing. How am I intimidating? George, even little pit bulls are intimidating. Even chihuahuas can be intimidating, little bro. It's your face, the way you look. So I had to remind myself to smile. And so here I am smiling because I love you and I care about you. Project warmth. Appear approachable and remember to smile. For anyone that's involved in ministry, especially one of the most important ministries here at our church, the parking lot ministry, the greeters, and the ushers, project warmth, appear approachable, and remember to smile, even if you don't feel like it, even if you're in pain, even if things that have happened that are just like, man, the worst week ever, smile anyway. Smile for people, project warmth, appear approachable, or maybe, maybe you need to take a break, you need to take a vacation until you're able to smile. Listen, very important that we do so for our children, that we do so for our neighbors, that we do so when we're walking around the you know, supermarket and people are not wearing masks. How do you look at them? As you're wearing your mask and they're not wearing their mask, how do you look at them? Let's flip that. For those of us that don't wear masks, and we look at the people that are wearing masks, and they're looking at us like, why are you not wearing a mask? How do you look at them? Do you look at them with like a judgmental, you know, uh, sort of a disrespectful, you're looking down upon them kind of look? Or are you smiling? Are you projecting warmth? Do you appear approachable? The other day I was at a store and someone coughed, and immediately I went... And then I had to go, oh wait, relax. It is what it is. Just wash your hands afterwards. It is what it is. So I just want to share with you, project warmth, appear approachable, remember to smile, be cordial, be genial, be pleasant, be kind, be gentle, be loving, be gracious, don't be quarrelsome. Be someone that is able to be used by God in any situation, in every situation, with any type of person. It's like what I tell people all the time. Make sure that you're able to minister to more people and not just a certain amount of people. You know, it's just like, I want to be able to minister to all types of people, not just one type of person. I don't want to be the kind that says, well, those type of people get me, so I don't know what your guys' problem is. No, no, no. I need to be able to minister to all people. And I want to be able to minister to all people. I don't care who they are, what their background is. I want to be able to minister to all people. Like Paul said, I become all things to all men. Why? That I may preach to all men the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why it's so important that I do this. Now, ah, man, I don't even know if I have time. We're going to do one more and that's it. Don't be covetous. That's a hard word for me to say. Don't be covetous or covetous. Be content. Now this word covetous or covetous, I'm going to go with covetous, means not a lover of silver. Again, it has to do with money. This is the second time that Paul brings up the topic of money. The first time was not greedy for money. This time he's saying don't covet money. Why? See, the elders of the church in Ephesus were receiving financial support from the ministry. So Paul, knowing the dangers of the love of money, exhorts these elders not to allow the, allow the desire for money to become their priority. Don't let money become your priority. So covetousness and the love of money disqualifies a person from leadership. Not only leadership, but just ministry and service in general. Now the great Methodist preacher, Pastor John Fletcher, was renowned in Britain for his devotion and generosity. When asked if he had any needs, this is the way he responded, I want nothing but more grace. Now, people were willing to give him anything he would have asked for. If he would have said, yeah, I want more money, I want a raise, they would have given it to him. But he didn't do that. Instead, he said, listen, the only thing I want is more grace. Before pastoring in Madeleine, England, 
he was given the opportunity to pastor at a smaller church with very light duty, but with really good pay. And this is how he responded. This is the way he replied to that opportunity. He said, that will not suit me. There's too much money and too little labor. And so he went to pastor in Madeleine, and his ministry lasted for so long. I mean, it's still, to this day, because of his ministry, because of his example, there are still Christians there living for Jesus and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a good example of a pastor, of a person in service that's about the people and not about the money or the benefits that come with being in ministry. Exodus 20, verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. The last commandment in the 10 commandments. The 10th commandment is about the matter of the heart. This one right here, the last one, is the matter of the heart. It's about the attitude. It's about the strong emotion. This commandment is unique because the other commandments were such that they could be seen, they could be tried, and found guilty of committing a certain act. But this commandment was based upon an attitude that could be undetectable. And for that matter, a society cannot convict people for what they are thinking and feeling. Yet this final commandment is a forbidden feeling. Why? Because covetousness can lead to a plethora of sins. See, coveting is a desire, a motivation so strong that the one who covets something will have it by any means possible, even if it involves committing evil. Coveting is a consuming desire. It becomes an idol. It's interesting that the first commandment is do not set up an idol before the Lord God. And then the last commandment is coveting. That if you do covet, you're going to make something into an idol. Coveting is a consuming desire which is highly competitive. It is an evil attitude which almost always leads to an evil act. Coveting is a kind of conspiracy in one's soul to commit evil. Coveting is the desire to have something which one doesn't have or which one doesn't think they have enough of. I mean, they have it, but they want more. Coveting always wants more. It is not content with what it already has, no matter how much it might be. Habakkuk talked about this in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5. His greed is as wide as hell. And really what he's saying here is his greed is going to lead him to hell. But his greed is as wide as hell, like death. He has never enough. King Solomon spoke about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 80. King Solomon said, This person who has no dependence, no son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches. This also is vanity and a grievous task. And there are so many things that we could covet besides money. It could be attention. It could be popularity. It could be other people's happiness or their looks or their spouses or their houses or their financial status, their possessions or their achievements or their opportunities or even their body figure. There are so many things that people covet. But yet in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Don't covet. Be content. Matter of fact, Warren Wiersbe in his B series, Be Satisfied, the book of Ecclesiastes. The last one is rules his household well, but that right there, I really want to take my time on that because I really want to talk about parenting. I really want to talk about the way we come across to our children, specifically because it talks about provoking our children or that our children should be in submission to us. So we're going to wait on that for next week. But I'm hoping that with today's Bible study, you have enough to be able to go, okay, Lord, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to work on. And this is what I'm doing. I'm encouraged. Father, we come before you and we just thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for being all of these things that you tell us to be. You already are these things. Jesus, you demonstrated these things. You are the perfect example of every single one of these things that we spoke about. Father, will you, through your Holy Spirit, 
Cause us to be obedient to your word, to be these things that you have called us to be, to be outstanding, Lord. Cause us to be outstanding, to stand out from the rest of the world. We are not of this world, but we are in this world. And while we're in this world, that we would be outstanding for you, that this would be our way we worship you, the way we thank you for saving us. Jesus, thank you for being so outstanding. Thank you for setting the example that we may follow you, that we may learn from you. Like you said, learn from me. We want to learn from you. Holy Spirit, do that work in us. Forgive us, Lord, where we're falling short. Thank you for exposing this to us. Cause us to change. Cause us to repent. Cause us to be better, to be outstanding. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.